apparently I've been muted for 20 minutes. Wow. <laughs> well, it's hard to keep reading and see the chat. Ah, uh, well, thank you for uh, letting me know. Um, and thank you for your valiant effort to let me know. That is terribly unfortunate. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I do appreciate the effort. I really do. Yeah, when I'm reading this, I'm reading this cold straight off, and my peripheral vision, there's nothing there. I, I'm right here. Well, that's how that goes. <laughs> Lots of voice acting, just no voice. <laughs> and you're watching this old fool just, just act away. <laughs> I'm like five voices in here. <laughs> Is that right? One, two, three, four, six voices in. Oh boy. Well. I guess that means I get to start this one over again. Oh, man. <laughs> Luckily, it's left overnight, and Mrs. Kahuna will not be upset. I go a little bit over. So, thanks for joining me. I probably got something in my Discord saying, Hey, Dopey, you're muted. Yep, yeah, no, none of those. But that's okay. <laughs> well, Link, thanks. Uh, that happens occasionally. So, welcome again. Or the first time, because now you can actually hear me. Um, this is Dracula, chapters 10 and 11. Um... <laughs> the previous chapters can be found on my YouTube channel. It's right there on the left. Um, yt.kahunatheelder.com Look under Kahuna Reads. You'll find chapters 1 through 10. We have met most of the main characters at this point. We've met Van Helsing. We've met Dracula himself. Jonathan Harker. Uh, Mina Harker. Lucy Westenra. We've met... Um, Dr. Seward, we've met Renfield. So now, uh, what has happened in, in, in the last installment, Van Helsing has an idea of what is going on with Lucy, why she's waking up pale and with a couple of prick marks in her neck, and has laid her down in her room with garlic all over the room. At the windows, he's rubbed garlic onto the the any entrance to the room, and gave her a necklace of garlic. So, where we are now is the next day. So once again, <laughs> once again, here we go. This is Bram Stoker's Dracula, chapters ten and eleven. Chapter 11, sorry, chapters 11 and 12. Bram Stoker's Dracula, chapter 11. Lucy Westenra's Diary. 12 September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me he was so fierce. And yet... He must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window, though the terrible struggle I have had against sleep so often of late, the pain of the sleeplessness, or the pain of the fear of sleep, with such unknown horrors as it has been for me, how blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads. 
whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep and lying like Ophelia in the play with virgin grants and maiden strumens. I never liked garlic before. Tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary. 13 September. Called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing as usual up to his time. The carriage order from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colors, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westerner coming out of the morning room. She's always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The child, dear child, is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she answered, You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How do you mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she actually had a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that the heavy odour would be too much for the dear child in her weak state. So I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen grey. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present. For he knew her state and how mischievous a shock it would be. He actually smiled on her as he held the door open for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair, and putting his hands before his face, began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. He raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. God! 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 He said. What have we done? What has this poor thing done? So we are so, so beset. Is there fate amongst us still? Set down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be, and in such a way? This poor mother, all-knowing, and all for the best as she think, does such a thing as lose her daughter, body, and soul. And we must not tell her, we must, must not even warn her, or she die, and then both die. Oh, how we are beset! How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly, he jumped to his feet. Come, he said. Come, we must see an act. Devils or not devils, or all the devils at once. It matters not. We fight him, all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again, I drew up the blind whilst, whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured, with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. 
Without a word, he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said. Today, you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic. Again some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Wessenra that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their odor was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over a care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I'm beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westerner's Diary 17 September Four days of and nights of peace. I'm getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing. Darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant. And then, long spells of oblivion, and rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great piece of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what, have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a box full arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away, as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam. But I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake, and dear Arthur's, for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again. Although the boughs or bats or something napped almost angrily against the window panes. The Paul Mall Gazette, 18 September. The Escaped Wolf The perilous adventure of our interviewer Interview with a keeper in the zoological gardens After many inquiries and almost as many refusals and perpetually using the words Paul Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over, and we were all satisfied. Then, when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, uh, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me for refusing to talk of professional subjects afore meals. I gives the wolves and the jackals and hyenas in all our section their tea before I begins to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions? I queried, wilful, wishful to get him into a talkative humor. Well, hitting of them over the head with a pole is one way. Scratching at the ears is another. When Jinches is flush, What's a bit of a show off to their gals? I don't so mind much, so much mind a fuss. They hit with a pole for I chucks in their dinner. 
but I'll wait till I've had this sherry and coffee, so to speak, before I tries on with his scratch. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same nature in us as in them near animals. Here's you a coming and asking of me questions about my business, and I'd act grumpy like that only for your blooming off quid I'd have seen you blow first before I'd answer. Not even when you ask me sarcastic like, if I'd like to ask the simple intended if you might ask me questions. <coughs> Without offense, did I tell you to go to hell? You did. And when I said you'd report me, when you said you'd report me for using of obscene language, and that was it, me over the head. But the off quid meant that all right. I want go I want to go in a fight, so I waited for the food, and I did my eye as the wolves, and lions and tigers doves. But Lord love your all, now that the old woman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me, rinsed out, rinsed me out with her blooming old teapot, and I've lit up, you may scratch my ears for all you're worth. It won't get even a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're coming at. That air escape wolf. Exactly. I want you to give me your view of it. Just tell me how it happened, and when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair would end. All right, governor. This is about the old story. That air wolf, what we call Berserker, it was one of three grey ones that came from Norway to Jamrakshas, which we bought off of him four years ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf. He never gave no trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for wanting to get out, or any other animal in the place. But there, you can't trust wolves no more than women. Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Mrs. Tom, with a cheery laugh. He's got minded animals so long, that blessed if he ain't like an old wolf himself. Oh, there ain't no harm in him. Well, sir, it's about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first heard my disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma which is ill. When I heard the yelp and an owl, and I kept him straight away. There was Berserker, a tearing like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man. Tall thin chap with a hook nose and a pointed beard, and with a few white hairs running through it. He had a odd gold look and red eyes. I sort of took a mislike to him. It seemed as if it was him that was irritated at. He had white kid gloves on in his hands, and he pointed out the animals to me and says, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Well, maybe it's you, says I. I did not like the airs as he'd give himself. We didn't get angry, so I hoped he would. We smile a kind of insolent smile. Mouthful of white, sharp teeth. Oh, no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh, yes, they would, I says, I imitating them. They always likes a bone or two to clean their teeth on about tea time. Which, you, has a bag full. Well, it was an odd thing. When the animals see us a-talking, they lay down. When I went over to Berserker, he let me stroke his ears same as ever. That there man come over, and blessed if he didn't put his hand and stroke the old wolf's ears too. <coughs> Take care, I said. Circus quick. Never mind, he says, I'm used to him. Well, are you in the business yourself? I says, taking off my hat. For a man what trades in wolves, and etc., is a good friend to keep us. No, he says. Not exactly in the business, but I have made pets of several. And with that, he lifts his hat as polite as the Lord and walks away. Old Berserker kept looking after him till he was out of sight. Then went and lay down in a corner and wouldn't come out the whole evening. Well, last night, so soon as the moon was up, the wolves here all began howling. And want nothing for them to howl at. There weren't no one near. Except someone that was evidently calling a dog somewhere is out back of the gardens in the park road. Once or twice I went out to see that all was right. And it was. Then the island stopped. Just before twelve o'clock, I took a look around before turning in. And bust me, but when I came opposite to old Berserker's cage, I see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty. 
That's all I know for certain. Well, did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was coming home from that time from Harmony. When he sees a big gray dog coming out through the garden edges. At least, so he says, I don't give much for it myself. For if he did, he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home. It was only after the escape of the wolf was made known, and we'd been up all night hunting the park for Berserker, that he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that was the harmony had got into his head. Well now, Mr. Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, I think I can. But I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall. If a man like you, who knows the animals from experience, can't hazard a guess, a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I account for it this way. Seems to me that there wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. <laughs> From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had been done service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in badinage with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart, so I said, Now, Mr. Builder, we'll consider that first half-sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Oh, right you are, sir. Excuse me, I know for a chaffing of you, but the old woman here winked at me, which is much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion of this is this. That air wolf is a hiding off somewheres. Gardner what didn't remember said he was got a galloping northward faster than a horse could go. I don't believe him. Well, you see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more nor dogs does. They're not being built that way. Wolves is fine things in storybook. And I dare say, when they gets in packs and does be chiving something, that's more a fear than they is. They can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. Lord bless you, in real life, the wolf is only a low creature, not half so bold or clever as a good dog. Not half as a quarter so much fighting him. This one ain't been used to fighting or even providing, providing for itself. And more like he's somewhere around the park and hiding and shivering off. If he thinks at all, wondering where he, get, he is to get his breakfast from. Maybe he's got down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye, won't some cook get a rum stop when she sees his green eyes are shining at her out of the dark? <laughs> if he can't get food, he's bound to look for it. My app, he may chance to light on a butcher's shop in time. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes a-walking off with a soldier, leaving of the infant in the perambulator, well then, I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window. Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. God bless me! If there ain't old berserker come back by himself! He went to the door and opened it. A most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea. After all, however, there is nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of a wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf that for half a day had paralyzed London and set all the children in the town shivering in their shoes, was there in a sort of penitent mood, and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with the most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent, he said, Eh, I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here is Ed, all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-getting over some blooming wall or some. It's a shame. People are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This here's what comes of it. Come along, berserker. 
He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage, with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fatted calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary 17 September I was engaged after dinner in my study posting up my books, which, due press of other work and the many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into a rear. Suddenly the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck, for such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand, and I, I saw he was dangerous. I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however. For before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right, and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort, and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in, and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up like a dog the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, The blood is life! The blood is the life! I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I've lost too much of late for my physical good. And then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary. I need rest, rest, rest. Happily, Van Helsing has not summoned for me, so I need not forego my sleep. Tonight, I could not well do without it. Telegram. Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given. Delivered late by 22 hours. 17 September. Do not fail to be at Hillington, Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time frequently, visit and see that the flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary. 18 September. Just off for train to London. The arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. Oh, night lost. I know by bitter experience what may happen in a night. Of course, it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra. 17 September, night. I write this and leave it to be soon so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed, as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby when Mina saved me and which I now know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come then when I did not want it. So, as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake Mother, and so I closed my door again. Then outside in the shrubbery I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing, except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened, and Mother looked in. Seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, came in and sat by me. 
she said to me even more sweetly and softly than her wont. I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared that she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me. So she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while, and then go back to her own bed. She lay there in my arms and I in hers. The flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her and at last succeeded and she lay quiet. But I could hear her poor heart still beating terribly. After a while there was the low howl again out in the shrubbery and shortly thereafter there was a crash at the window and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window bind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great, gaunt, grey wolf. The mother cried out in fright and struggled up into a sitting posture and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing round my neck and tore it away from me. For a second or two she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over struck by lightning and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two the room and all round seemed to spin round I kept my eyes fixed on the window but the wolf drew his head back and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that travelers describe when there is a simoon in the desert I tried to stir but there was some spell upon me dear mother's poor body which seemed to grow cold already her dear heart had ceased to beat weighed me down and I remembered no more for a while the time did not seem long but very very awful till I recovered consciousness again somewhere near a passing bell was tolling the dogs all round the neighborhood were howling and in our shrubbery seemingly just outside Nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and horror and terror and weakness. The sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sound seemed to have awakened the maids too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what happened and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother, and laid her, covered up with a sheet, on the bed after I got up. They were all so frightened and nervous. I directed them to go to the dining room and each have a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maid shrieked, and then went in a body to the dining room laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. When they were there, I remember what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them, and besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids had not come back. I called for them, but got no answer. So I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelled of laudanum. In looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her, oh, did use. It was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I'm back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her, and I am alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead. I dare not go out, for I can now hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the draft from the window. The lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from heart this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone. It is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur. 
if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. Chapter 12, Dr. Seward's Diary. 18 September. I drove at once to Hillingham and arrived early. Keeping my cab at the gate, I went up the avenue alone. I knocked gently and rang as quietly as possible, for I feared to disturb Lucy or her mother, and hoped only to bring a servant to the door. After a while, finding no response, I knocked and rang again. Still, no answer. I cursed the laziness of the servants that they should lie abed at such an hour, for it was now ten o'clock. And so rang and knocked again, but more impatiently, but still without response. Hitherto, I had blamed only the servants, but now a terrible fear began to assail me. Was this desolation but another link in the chain of doom which seemed drawing tight around us? Was it indeed a house of death to which I had come too late? I knew that minutes, even seconds of delay, might mean hours of danger to Lucy if she had again one of those frightful relapses. I went round the house to try if I could find, by chance, an entry anywhere. I could find no means of ingress. Every window and door was fastened and locked. I turned, baffled, to the porch. As I did so, I heard the rapid pit-pat of the swiftly driven horse's feet. They stopped at the gate, and a few seconds later I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. When he saw me, he gasped out. Then it was you! I'm just arrived. How is she? Are we too late? Did you not get my telegram? I answered as quickly and coherently as I could that I'd only got his telegram early in the morning and had not lost a minute in coming here. And I could not make any one in the house hear me. He paused and raised his hat as he said so solemnly. Then I fear we are too late. God's will be done. With his usual recuperative energy, he went on. Come. If there be no way to open it to get in, we must wake on. Time is all in all to us now. We ran round to the back of the house, where there was a kitchen window. The professor took a small surgical saw from his case, and handing it to me, pointed to the iron bars which guarded the window. I attacked them at once, and had very soon cut through three of them. Then, with a long, thin knife, we pushed back the fastening of the sashes, and opened the window. I helped the professor in and followed him. There was no one in the kitchen or in the servants' rooms, which were close at hand. We tried all the rooms as we went along, and in the dining room, dimly lit by the rays of light through the shutters, found four servant women lying on the floor. There was no need to think of them dead, for their stertorous breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. Van Helsing and I looked at each other, and as we moved away, he said, We can attend to them later. Then we ascended to Lucy's room. For an instant or two, we paused at the door to listen, but there was no sound that we could hear. With white faces and trembling hands, we opened the door gently and entered the room. How shall I describe what I saw? On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay farthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet, the edge of which had been blown back by the draught through the broken window, showing the drawn white face with a look of terror fixed upon it. By her side lay Lucy, with face white and still more drawn. The flowers which had been round her neck we found upon her mother's bosom. Her throat was bare showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but looking horribly white and mangled. Without a word, the professor bent over the bed, his head almost touching poor Lucy's breast. Then he gave a quick turn of his head as one of one who listens and leaped to his feet. He cried out to me, It is not yet too late! Quick! Quick! Bring the brandy! I flew downstairs and returned with it, taking care to smell and taste it, lest it, too, were drugged like the decanter of sherry which I had found on the table. The maids were still breathing, but more restlessly, and I fancied the narcotic was, was wearing off. I did not stay to make sure, but returned to Van Helsing. He rubbed the brandy, as on other occasion, on her lips and gums and on her wrists and the palms of her hands. He said to me, I can do this, all that can be at the present. You go pick those maids. Flick them in the face with the wet towel and flick them hard. Makes them get heat and fire and a warm bath. This poor soul is nearly as cold as that behi beside her. 
She will need to be heated before we can do anything more. I went at once and found little difficulty in waking three of the women. The fourth was only a young girl, and the drug had evidently affected her more strongly, so I lifted her on the sofa and let her sleep. The others were dazed at first, but as remembrance came back to them, they cried and sobbed in a hysterical manner. I was stern with them, however, and would not let them talk. I told them that one life was bad enough to lose, and if they delayed, they would sacrifice Miss Lucy. So, sobbing and crying, they went about their way, half-clad as they were, with, and prepared fire and water. Fortunately, the kitchen and boiler fires were still alive, and there was no lack of hot water. We got a bath, and carried Lucy out as she was, and placed her in it. Whilst we were busy chafing her limbs, there was a knock at the hall door. One of the maids ran off, hurried on some clothes, and opened it. Then she returned and whispered to us that there was a gentleman who had come with a message from Mr. Homewood. I bade her simply tell him that he must wait, for we could see no one now. She went away with the message, and engrossed with our work, I clean forgot all about him. I never saw in all my experience Professor work in such deadly earnest. I knew, as he knew, that it was a stand-up fight with death, and in a pause told him so. He answered me in a way that I did not understand, but with the sternest look that his face could wear. If that were all, I would stop here, Vaviana, and let her fade away into peace. For I see no light in life over her horizon. He went on with his work, if possible, with renewed and more frenzied vigor. Presently, we both began to be conscious that the heat was beginning to be of some effect. Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope, and her lungs had a perceptible movement. Van Helsing's face almost beamed as we lifted her from the bath and rolled her in a hot sheet to dry her. He said to me, The first gain is ours. Check to the king. We took Lucy into another room, which had now, by now, been prepared, and laid her in bed and forced a few drops of brandy down her throat. I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief around her throat. She was still unconscious, and was quite as bad as, if not worse than, we had ever seen her. Van Helsing called in one of the women and told her to stay with her and not to take her eyes off her till we returned, and then beckoned me out of the room. We must consult as to what is to be done, he said as we descended the stairs. In the hall, he opened the dining room door and we passed in, he closing the door carefully behind him. The shutters had been opened, but the blinds were already down, with that obedience to the etiquette of death, which the British woman of the lower classes always rigidly observes. The room, therefore, was dimly dark. It was, however, light enough for our purposes. Van Helsing's sternness was somewhat relieved by a look of perplexity. He was eventually, evidently torturing his mind about something, so I waited for an instant, and he spoke. What are we to do now? Where are we to turn for help? We must have another transfusion of blood, and that soon, or that poor girl's life won't be worth an hour's purchase. You are exhausted already. I am exhausted too. I fail to trust those women, even if they would have courage to submit. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her? What's the matter with me, anyhow? The voice came from the sofa across the room, and its tones brought relief and joy to my heart, for they were those of Quincy Morris. Van Helsing started angrily at the first sound, but his face softened, and a glad look came into his eyes. I cried out, Quincy Morris! and rushed towards him with outstretched hands. What brought you here? As I, I cried as our hands met. Well, I guess art is the cause. He handed me a telegram. Have not heard from Seward for three days, and I am terribly anxious. Cannot leave. Father still in the same condition. Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay. Homewood. I think I came in just in the nick of time. You know you only have to tell me what to do. Van Helsing strode forward and took his hand, looking him straight in the eyes, and he said, A brave man's blood is the best thing on this earth when a woman is in trouble. You're a man, and no mistake. Well, the devil may work against us for all he's worth, but God sends us men when we want them. Once again, we went through that ghastly operation. I have not the heart to go through with the details. 
Lucy had got a terrible shock and it told on her more than before, but though plenty of blood went into her veins, her body did not respond to the treatment as well as on the other occasions. Her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear. However, the action of both heart and lungs improved, and Van Helsing made a subcutaneous injection of morphia, as before, and with good effect. Her faint became a profound slumber. The professor watched whilst I went downstairs with Quincy Morris and sent one of the maids off one of the cabmen who were waiting. I left Quincy lying down after having a glass of wine and told the cook to ready a good breakfast. Then a thought struck me. I went back to the room where Lucy now was. When I came softly in, I found Val Hens Van Helsing with a sheet or two of note paper in his hand. He had evidently read it and was thinking it over as he sat with his hand to his brow. There was a look of grim satisfaction in his face, as of one who has had a doubt solved. He handed me the paper, saying only, It dropped from Lucy's breast when we carried her to the bass. When I had read it, I stood looking at the professor, and after a pause, asked him, In God's name, what does it all mean? Was she, or is she, mad? What sort of horrible danger is it? I was so bewildered, I did not know what to say more. And Helsing put out his hand and took the paper, saying, Do not trouble about it now. Forget about it for the present. You shall know and understand it all in good time, but it will be later. And now, what is it that you say you came to me to say? This brought me back to fact, and I was all myself again. I came to speak about the certificate of death. If we do not act properly and wisely, there may be an inquest, and that paper would surely have to be perused. I am in hopes that we need have no inquest, or if we had it, would surely kill poor Lucy, if nothing else did. I know, and you know, and the, the doctor who attended her knows, that Mrs. Westerner had a disease of the heart, and we can certify that she did of it, died of it. Let us fill up the certificate at once, and I shall take it myself to the registrar and go on to the undertaker. Oh, good, my friend John. Well sort of. Truly, Miss Lucy, if she be said in the foes that beset her, is at least happy in the friends that love her. One, two, three, all open their veins for her, besides one old man. Ah, yes, I know, friend John. I am not blind. I love you all the more for it. I'll go. In the hall, I met Quincy Morris with a telegram for Arthur, telling him that Mrs. Westerner had was dead that Lucy had also been ill, but was now going on better, and that Van Helsing and I were with her. I told him where I was going, and he hurried me out, but as I was going, he said, When you come back, Jack, may I have two words with you all to ourselves? I nodded in reply and went out. I found no difficulty about the registration, and arranged with the local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin and make arrangements. When I got back to Quincy, when I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. I told him I would see him as soon as I knew about Lucy and went up to her room. She was still sleeping, and the professor seemingly had not moved from his seat at her side. From his putting his finger to his lips, I gathered that he expected her to wake before long and was afraid of forestalling nature. So I went down to Quincy and took him into the breakfast room where the blinds were not drawn down, which was a little more cheerful, or rather less cheerless, than the other rooms. When we were alone, he said to me, Jack Seward, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I've no right to be. This is no ordinary case. You know I loved that girl and wanted to marry her. But, although that's all past and gone, I can't help feeling anxious about her all the same. What is it, what is it that's wrong with her? Dutchman, a fine old fellow he is. I can see that. Said that that time you two came into a room, you must have another transfusion of blood, and that both you and he were exhausted. I know well that you medical men speak in camera, and a man must not expect to know what they do and what they consult about in private. This is no common matter. Whatever it is, I've done my part. Is not that so? That's so, I said, and he went on. I take it that both you and Van Helsing have done already what I did today. Is not that so? That's so. I guess Art was in it too. 
When I saw him four days ago down at his own place, he looked queer. I've not seen anything pulled down so quick since I was on the pampas and had a mare that I was fond of go to grass all in a night. One of those big bats that they call vampires had got her in the night. And what with his gorge and the vein left open, there wasn't enough blood left in her. Let her stand up. Trying to put a bullet through her so she lay. Jack, if you may tell me without betraying confidence, Arthur was the first. It's not that so. As he spoke, the poor fellow looked terribly anxious. He was in a torture of suspense regarding the woman he loved, and his utter ignorance of the terrible mystery which seemed to surround her intensified his pain. His very heart was bleeding, and it took all the manhood of him, and there was a royal lot of it, too, to keep him from breaking down. I paused before answering, for I felt that I must not betray anything which the professor kept, wished kept secret. But already he knew so much, and guessed so much. There could be no reason for not answering, so I answered in the same frame. That's so. How long has this been going on? About ten days. Ten days? Well, I guess, Jack Seward, that that poor pretty creature that we all love has had put into her veins within that time the blood of four strong men. And alive, her whole body wouldn't hold it. Then, coming close to me, he spoke in a fierce half-whisper. What took it out? I shook my head. That, I said, is the crux. Van Helsing is simply frantic about it, and I am at my wit's end. I can't even hazard a guess. There has been a series of little circumstances which have thrown out all our calculations as to Lucy being properly watched. These shall not occur again. Here we stay until all be well. Or ill. Quincy held out his hand. Count me in, he said. You and the Dutchman will tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When she woke later in the afternoon, Lucy's first movement was to feel in her breast, and to my surprise, deduce the paper which Van Helsing had given me to read. The careful professor had replaced it where he had come from, lest on waking she should be alarmed. Her eye then lit on Van Helsing and on me too, and gladdened. She looked about the room, and seeing where she was, shuddered. She gave a loud cry and put her poor thin hands before her pale face. We both understood what that meant. She had realized, to the full, her mother's death. So we tried what we could to comfort her. Doubtless sympathy eased her somewhat. But she was very low in thought and spirit, and wept silently and weakly for a long time. We told her that he, either both of us, either or both of us, would now remain with her all the time. And that seemed to comfort her. Towards dusk she fell into a doze. Here a very odd thing occurred. Whilst she was still asleep, she took the paper from her breast and tore it in two. Van Helsing stepped over and took the pieces from her. All the same, however, she went on with the action of tearing as though the material was still in her hands. Finally, she lifted her hands and opened them as though scattering the fragments. Van Helsing seemed surprised and his brows gathered as if in thought, but he said nothing. 19 September. All night, last night, she slept fitfully. Being always afraid to sleep and something weaker when she woke from it. The professor and I took turns in watch, and we never left her for a moment unattended. Quincy Morris said nothing about his intention, but I knew that all night long he patrolled round and round the house. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. She was hardly able to turn her head, and the little nourishment which she could take seemed to do her no good. At times she slept, and both Van Helsing and I noticed the difference in her, between sleeping and waking. Whilst asleep, she looked stronger, although more haggard. Her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively longer and sharper than usual. When she woke, the softness of her eyes evidently changed the expression, for she looked her own self, although a dying one. In the afternoon, she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived, it was nearly six o'clock, and the sun was setting full and warm. 
and the red light streamed in through the window and gave more color to the pale cheeks. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choking with emotion, and none of us could speak. In the hours that had passed, the fits of sleep, or the comatose condition that passed for it, had grown more frequent, so that the pauses when conversation was possible were shortened. Arthur's presence, however, seemed to act as a stimulant. She rallied a little, and spoke to him more brightly than she had done since we arrived. He too pulled himself together and spoke as cheerily as he could, so that the best was made of everything. It was now nearly one o'clock, and he and Van Helsing are sitting with her. I am to relieve them in a quarter of an hour. I am entering this on Lucy's phonograph. Until six o'clock they are to try to rest. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching. The shock has been too great. The poor child cannot rally. God help us all. Letter. Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Unopened by her. My dearest Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you, or indeed since I wrote. You will pardon me, I know, for all my faults, when you have read all my budget of news. Well, it got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, though he had an attack of gout, Mr. Hawkins. He took us to his house, where there were rooms for us all nice and comfortable, and we dined together. After dinner, Mr. Hawkins said, My dears, I want to drink to your health and prosperity, and may every blessing attend you both. I know you both from children, and have with love and pride seen you grow up. Now, I want you to make your home here with me. I have left to me neither chick nor child. All are gone, and in my will I have left you everything. I cried, Lucy dear, as Jonathan and the old man clasped hands. Our evening was a very, very happy one. So here we are, installed in this beautiful old house, and from both my bedroom and the drawing room I can see the great elms of the cathedral close with their great black stems standing out against the old yellow stone of the cathedral. And I can hear the rooks overhead cawing and cawing and chattering and gossiping all day, after the manner of rooks and humans. I am busy, I need not tell you, arranging things and housekeeping. Jonathan and Mr. Hawkins are busy all day. Or, now that Jonathan is a partner, Mr. Hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients. How is your dear mother getting on? I wish I could run up to town for a day or two to see you, dear, but I dare not go yet with so much on my shoulders. And Jonathan wants looking after still. He is beginning to put some flesh on his bones again, but he was terribly weakened by the long illness. Even now, he sometimes starts out of his sleep in a sudden way and awakes all trembling until I can coax him back to his usual placidity. However, thank God these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on, and they will pass in time, away altogether. I trust. And now I have told you my use. Let me ask yours. When are you to be married, and where? And who is to perform the ceremony? And what are you to wear? And is it to be a public or private wedding? Tell me all about it, dear. Tell me all about everything, for there is nothing which interests you which will not be dear to me. Jonathan asked me to send his respectful duty, but I do not think that is good enough from a junior partner of the important firm Hawkins & Harker. And so, as you love me, and he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I sent you simply his love instead. Goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and all blessings on you. Yours, Mina Harker. Report from Patrick Hennessy, M.D., M.R.C.S.L.K.Q.C.P.I., etc., etc., to John Seward, M.D., 20 September. My dear sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. He has had another outbreak which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with any unhappy results. This afternoon, a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds are but on ours, the house to which, you will remember, the patient ran twice away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter their way, as they were strangers. I was myself looking out 
of the study window having a smoke after dinner and saw one of them come up to the house. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling him to shut up for a foul mouth beggar, whereon our man accused him of robbing him and wanting to murder him, and said that he would hinder him if he were to swing for it. I opened the window and signed to the man not to notice, so he contented himself after looking the place over and making up his mind as to what kind of a place he had got to by saying, Oh, bless you, sir. I wouldn't mind what was said to me in a blooming madhouse. I pity in the governor for having to live in the house with a wild beast like that. Then he went his way civilly enough. I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went away, followed by threats and curses and revilings from our man. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, since he is usually such a well-behaved man, and except his violent fits, nothing of the kind had ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, quite composed and most genial in his manner. I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant, and led me to believe he was completely oblivious of the affair. It was, I am sorry to say, however, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I heard of him again. This time he had broken out through the window of his room and was running down the avenue. I called to the attendants to follow me and I ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road, having on it some great wooden boxes. The men were wiping their foreheads and were flushed in the face, as if with violent exercise. Before I could get up to him, the patient rushed at them, and pulling one of them off the cart began to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at the moment, I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt end of his heavy whip. It was a terrible blow, but he did not seem to mind it, but seized him also and struggled with the three of us, pulling us to and fro as if we were kittens. You know I am no lightweight, and the others were both burly men. At first, he was silent in his fighting, but as we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him, he began to shout, I'll frustrate them. They shan't rob me. They shan't murder me by inches. I'll fight for my lord and master. <laughs> and all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house, and I put him in the padded room. One of the attendants, Hardy, had a finger broken. However, I set it all right, and he is going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of actions for damages, and promised to rain all the penalties of law on us. Their threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of the two of them by a feeble madman. They said that if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of him. They gave as another reason for their defeat the extraordinary state of drought, to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labors to any place of public entertainment. I quite understood their drift. And after a stiff glass of grog, or rather more of the same, and with each a sovereign in hand, they made light of the attack and swore that they would encounter a worse madman any day for the pleasure of meeting so blooming good a bloke as your correspondent. I took their names and addresses in case they might be needed. They are as follows. Jack Smollett of Dunning's Rents, King's George, King George's Road, Great Walworth, and Thomas Snelling, Peter Farley's Row, Guide Court, Bethnal Green. They are both in the employments of Harris and Sons, Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Master's Yard, sir. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here, and shall wire you at once if there is anything of importance. Believe me, dear sir, yours faithfully, Patrick Hennessy. Letter, Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Unopened by her. 18 September. My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. Some may not think it so sad for us, but we have both come to so love him that it really seems as though we had lost a father. I never knew either father or mother, so that the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. It is not only that he feels sorrow, deep sorrow for the dear good man who has befriended him all his life, and now, at the end, has treated him like his own son and left him a fortune. 
which to people of our modest bringing up is wealth beyond the dream of avarice, but Jonathan feels it on another account. He says the amount of responsibility which it puts upon him makes him nervous. He begins to doubt himself. I try to cheer him up, and my belief in him helps him to have a belief in himself. But it is here that the grave shock he experienced tells upon him the most. Oh, it is too hard that a sweet, simple, noble, strong nature such as his, a nature which enabled him by our dear good friend's aid to rise from clerk to master in a few years, should be so injured that the very essence of its strength is gone. Forgive me, my dear, if I worry you with my troubles in the midst of your own happiness. But Lucy, dear, I must tell someone. For the strain of keeping up a brave and cheerful appearance to Jonathan tries me, and I have no one here that I can confide in. I dread coming up to London, as we must do the day after tomorrow. For more poor Mr. Harkins left in his will that he was to be buried in the grave with his father. As there are no relations at all, Jonathan will have to be the chief mourner. I shall try to run over to see you, dearest, if only for a few minutes. Forgive me for troubling you. With all blessings, your loving Mina Harker. Dr. Seward's Diary. 20 September. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. I'm too miserable, too low-spirited, too sick of the world and all in it, including life itself. I would not care if I heard this moment the flapping of the wings of the Angel of Death. And he has been flapping those grim wings to some purpose of late. Lucy's mother and Arthur's father, and now... Let me get on with my work. I duly relieved Van Helsing in his work, in his watch over Lucy. We wanted Arthur to go to rest also, but he refused at first. It was only when I told him that we should want him to help us during the day, and that we must not all break down for want of rest lest Lucy should suffer, that he agreed to go. Van Helsing was very kind to him. Come, my child, he said. Come with me. You are sick and weak, and have much sorrow and much mental pain, as well as that tax on your strength that we know of. You must not be alone. For to be alone is to be full of fears and alarms. Come to the drawing room, where there is a big fire, and there are two sofas. You shall lie on one, and I on the other. And our sympathy will be comfort to each other, even though we do not speak, and even if we sleep. Arthur went off with him, casting back a longing look on Lucy's face, which lay in her pillow, almost whiter than the lawn. She lay quite still, and I looked round the room to see that all was it should be. I could see the professor had carried out in this room, as in the other, his purpose of using the garlic. The whole of the window sashes reeked with it, and round Lucy's neck, over the silk handkerchief which Van Helsing made her keep on, which was a rough chaplet of the same odorous flowers. Lucy was breathing somewhat stertorously, and her face was at its worst, for the open mouth showed the pale gums. Her teeth and the dim, uncertain light seemed longer and sharper than they had been in the morning. In particular, by some trick of the light, canine teeth looked longer and sharper than the rest. I sat down by her, and presently she moved uneasily. At the same moment there came a sort of dull flapping or buffeting at the window. I went over to it softly and peeped out by the corner of the blind. There was a full moonlight, and I could see that the noise was made by a great bat, which wheeled round, doubtless attracted by the lights, although so dim, and every now and again struck the window with its wings. When I came back to my seat, I found that Lucy had moved slightly and had torn away the garlic flowers from her throat. I replaced them as well as I could and sat watching her. Presently, she woke. I gave her food as Van Helsing had prescribed. She took but a little and that languidly. There did not seem to be with her now the unconscious struggle for life and strength that hitherto had so marked her illness. It struck me as curious that the moment she became conscious, she pressed the garlic flowers close to her. It was certainly odd that whenever she got into that lethargic state with the stertorous breathing, she put the flowers from her, but that when she waked she clutched them close. There was no possibility of making any mistake about this, for in the long hours that followed she had many spells of sleeping and waking and repeated both actions many times. At six o'clock Van Helsing came to relieve me. Arthur had then fallen into a doze, 
and he'd mercifully let him sleep on. When he saw Lucy's face, I could hear the sissing indraw of his breath, and he said to me in a sharp whisper, Draw up, the blind. I want light. And he bent down, and with his face almost touching Lucy's, examined her carefully. He removed the flowers and lifted the silk handkerchief from her throat, and as he did so, started back, and I could hear his ejaculation. Mein Gott! As it was smothered in his throat, I bent over and looked too as I noticed some queer chill came over me. The wounds on the throat absolutely disappeared. For fully five minutes, Van Helsing stood looking at her with his face at its sternest. Then he turned to me and he said, Call me. She is dying. It will not be long now. It will be much difference, mark me, when there is, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. He trusts us and we have promised him. I went to the dining room and waked him. He was dazed for a moment, but when he saw the sunlight streaming in through the edges of the shutters, he thought he was late and expressed his fear. I assured him that Lucy was still asleep, but told him as gently as I could that both Van Helsing and I feared that the end was near. He covered his face with his hands and slid down on his knees by the sofa, where he remained perhaps a minute, with his head buried, praying, whilst his shoulders shook with grief. I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said, my dear fellow, summon all your fortitude. It will be best and easiest for her. When we came into Lucy's room, I could see that Van Helsing had, with his usual forethought, been putting matters straight and making everything look as pleasing as possible. He had even brushed Lucy's hair so that it lay on the pillow in its usual sunny ripples. When we came into the room, she opened her eyes and, seeing him, whispered softly, Father, oh, my love, I'm so glad you have come. He was stooping to kiss her when Van Helsing motioned him back. No! He whispered, Not yet. Hold her hand. It will come for her more. So Arthur took his hand and knelt beside her, and she looked her best, with all the soft lines matching the angelic beauty of her eyes. And gradually her eyes closed. She sank to sleep. For a little bit, little bit, her breast heaved softly, and then her breath came and went like a tired child's. And then, insensibly, there came the strange change which I had noticed in the night. Her breathing grew stertorous. The mouth opened and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look longer and sharper than ever. A sort of sleep-waking, vague, unconscious way, she opened her eyes, were now dull and hard at once, and she said in a soft, voluptuous voice, such as I had never heard from her lips, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so glad you have come. Kiss me. Arthur bent eagerly over to kiss her, but at that instinct, Van Helsing, who, like me, had been startled by her voice, swooped upon him and, catching him by the neck with both hands, dragged him back with a fury of strength which I have never thought he could have possessed, and actually hurled him across the room. Not for your life, he said, not for your living soul and hers. Then he stood between them like a lion at bay. Arthur was so taken aback he did not know for a moment what to do or say, and before any impulse of violence could seize him, he realized the place and occasion and stood silent, waiting. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy, as did Van Helsing. We saw a spasm as of rage flit like a shadow over her face. The sharp teeth champed together. Then her eyes closed and she breathed heavily. Very shortly after she opened her eyes in all their softness and putting out her poor, pale, thin hand, took Van Helsing's great brown one, drawing it to her, and kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice, but with untellable pathos. My true friend, and his. Oh, guard him. Give him peace. I swear it, he said solemnly, kneeling beside her and holding up his hand as one who registers an oath. Then he turned to Arthur and said to him, Come, my child, take her hand in yours, and kiss her on the forehead, but only once. Their eyes met instead of their lips, and so they parted.
Lucy's eyes closed, and Van Helsing, who had been watching closely, took Arthur's arm and drew him away. And then Lucy's breathing became stertorous again, and all at once, it ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She's dead. I took Arthur by the arm and led him away to the drawing room where he sat down, covered his face with his hands, sobbing in a way that nearly broke me down to see. I went back to the room and found Van Helsing looking at poor Lucy, and his face was sterner than ever. Some change had come over her body. Death had given back part of her beauty for her brow and cheeks, had recovered some of their flowing lines. Even the lips had lost their deadly pallor. It was as if the blood, no longer needed for the working of the heart, had gone to make the harshness of death as little rude as might be. We thought her dying whilst she slept, and sleeping while she died. I stood behind Van Helsing and said, Ah well, there is peace for her at last, it is the end. He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, Not so, alas, not so. It is only the beginning. When I asked him what he meant, he only shook his head and answered, We can do nothing at yet. Wait and see. And that, my friends, is chapters 11 and 12 of Bram Stoker's Dracula. This will be up on YouTube uh, in about the next week. Um, if you want to see the previous episodes, they're all there. yt.kahunatheelder.com will take you straight to my channel. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Barbarossa is far too kind. Uh, sorry if you were here for the first 20 minutes where I was absolutely muted and had to restart. My apologies. I will edit that out before I do anything with it. But thank you very much. Um, sometimes it's a challenge because uh, in this one, I think I had eight different voices I had to do. Maybe nine. So today was a bit of a challenge. But I enjoy doing it. And I hope you guys are enjoying hearing it. Um, if you like these, do me a favor. Subscribe on YouTube. Then, then you'll get the bell letting you know that I've put another one up. It's good you missed that part because it was 20 minutes of just the freaky sounds in the background and me. I was acting and nobody could hear anything. Can I get your YouTube yet? The easiest way is yt.kahunatheelder.com and that will go straight to my YouTube channel. Look for the stuff. Um, in fact, let me... Um, I'll put the link up here. yt.kahunatheelder.com the elder if I could spell it right I'd be great dot com um, that will take you straight to my YouTube channel and uh, you can see the other episodes um, next week we'll be doing 13 and 14 and we are about halfway through the book at this point so the plot is uh, getting thicker as they say <laughs> but once again, if you liked it, thank you. Um, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to support me in doing this stuff too, hey, subscribe here too. Um, if you're a follower, awesome. Thank you so much. If you can see your way to, to subscribing, that's also awesome too. Um, but otherwise, I will be doing this again next week. We'll do chapters 13 and 14 next week. 4 o'clock on Thursday, 4 o'clock Pacific. That's 7 o'clock Eastern, and I believe that is 11 p.m. GMT, right? Yeah, we're minus seven here. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I will be back tomorrow morning with Kahuna Matata, another set of writing streams and stream raiders and all that fun. Like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching it. And um, you guys have a great evening. I'll see you guys later.